Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite where I... This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I, I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, why that's so, why that's so, why that's so. Why that's Greetings, so. dear listeners, and welcome to season two of the Tales from Astlantis podcast. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa and Ruben Ariano Tlacateca. So, how have you been, man? It's been a while. It has been a while. And I must say that it was, uh, I missed uh, getting back into the show and, and talking about some cool Mexicayo Advanza. Mesoamerican topics. Yeah, me too. I, I've been uh, I've been jonesing to get back to the podcast, so I'm glad that uh, we're kicking off season two with a very special episode, as I like to call it, Atlantis Tale Boogaloo Two. <laughs> well, we've got some cool stuff planned for uh, for this season. A lot of cool interviews. We're going to be bringing on more guests. We're going to be uh, exploring some different aspects of the Mexicayote and just sort of um, pseudo history slash conspiracy theory type topics in general. So I'm very excited to dig in. Conspiracies? There's no conspiracies in Mexicayote. <laughs> what are you talking about, Curly? Those things don't exist. Oh, but they do. And we're going to be cracking open that walnut this season on Tales from Atlantis. I also want to remind everybody that they can hit us up on social media if they are so inclined at Curly Tlapoyawa on Twitter and Instagram. We've got at Tales from Aztlantis on Instagram, and we also have an official Twitter account, right? It's called Aztlantis Tales. Um, it doesn't have the Tales from Aztlantis uh, on the handle, but on if you search for it, uh, Tales uh, from Aztlantis, you will get to it. So at Aztlantis Tales on Twitter. And uh, we're going to be doing something different this season. I'm going to be offering some live streams as bonus content. We're also going to be providing a lot more premium content for our Patreon supporters. So if you are so inclined, please visit talesfromastlantis.com where you can buy merch associated with the podcast and also sign up to be a Patreon supporter. So exciting times. And hit us up when you do um, get some merch. If you get a t-shirt or if you can buy one of the mugs, you know, just take a picture and uh, hit us up on, on the social media accounts so we can check it out. Yeah, tag us. It'd be nice to know uh, how far uh, how far stuff is getting out there. Yeah, I also wanted to mention that my article on Danza was finally published in the Journal of Festive Studies, Volume 3, Number 1. The name of uh, this volume is called The Materiality of Festivity, and it's edited by Isabel Machado. And the title of my article is El es Dios, A Historical Interpretation of Danza Azteca as a Revitalization Movement. 
And essentially what I do, just to, you know, give you a, a very basic summary of the article, is that I look at its evolution from its origins through its evolution from Concherismo to the Azteca Chichimeca tradition and then to tradition tied to Mexicayot. And I also uh, offer some thoughts on this idea of it being part of uh, the broader revitalizationist tradition which is some of the stuff that we talk about. It kind of ties into some of the things that we talk about here in this podcast with the people like the MCRCA, which we're also in a revitalization movement of a sort. All right, so take a read, hit me up, and let me know what you think. So this season, we've decided to start it off with the little thing I like to call the four disagreements. Not too long ago, I mentioned on a Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex Facebook page that I hold a deep appreciation for the beautiful symbolism of being cleansed with copal smoke before participating in our ceremonies. I was trying to make the point that, despite views to the contrary, we do not need to ascribe magical properties to our modern ceremonial practices to appear more valid. Not everyone was thrilled with this observation. One individual went so far as to tell me that not only was I wrong, but that Copal was a living relative that possesses its own will. Others made similar claims. Some were shocked that I would even dare suggest such a thing. Frankly, I found such a response to be unfortunate, if not entirely unsurprising. However, a good amount of people did agree with me. Now, let me be clear. I love participating in our rituals and ceremonies. I love the beauty of the music and the song. I love the complexity of the ceremony, the smell of the copal and the sound of the rattles. I love the symbolism and metaphor and the raw collective energy of our synchronized movements as we dance. Is this not enough? Isn't the communal experience of coming together with our families and friends to participate in the act of cultural continuity enough? Can't we enjoy the inevitable array of food, music, and laughter that follows the ceremony without adding magical thinking to the mix? And what about the fact that participating in our traditions is fun, that it's enjoyable? Isn't this enough? Why do we feel the need to associate mystical properties with something so characteristically human. So, what do I mean by magical thinking? Well, for this episode, magical thinking is any worldview that relies on a belief in the supernatural to explain how and why things happen. For example, the literal view that we must petition Tlaloc for rain and that non-belief in Tlaloc as a living god or teteo will result in drought. I argue that our rituals and ceremonies are viewed better as metaphorical expressions and that they serve practical purposes of engendering community and expressing cultural resiliency. So, wait a minute, Curly. Didn't our ancestors have a supernatural view of the world? Well, yeah, sure. At some point, they most likely did. Belief in the supernatural is pretty common among all ancient and modern cultures. But let's not allow our culture to remain frozen in time. To do so, I believe, is to ignore the philosophical advancements that were taking place in Mesoamerica at the moment of the Spanish invasion. Historians like the late Miguel Leon Portilla have argued that the Tlamatinime, the teachers and philosophers, were actively shifting their cosmovision away from myth and towards a more scientific worldview based on rational discoveries. Now, you might agree with this or disagree with this. If you want to know more about how I feel about it, uh, I cover more of it in my book, um, Our Slippery Earth. And you can see my personal perspective on that. But wait, Curly, what about the fact that some of uh, Leon Portilla's uh, interpretations have come into question as of late? You know, namely Ometeo. Uh, can we really trust what he has to say on this sub subject? That is a good question. And it's actually something that we get to a little bit later on in the episode in terms of examining 
the validity of certain sources, whether we should trust certain sources, and the need to examine individual claims based on their own merits. So we will be covering that a little bit later. Now, to continue, theirs was a worldview in which the language of myth was being adapted to explain philosophical observations about the world around them. I honestly believe that left undisturbed, this worldview would have evolved into something resembling pantheistic atheism or scientific pantheism rather than the blend of New Age pseudoscience and Catholic dogma that permeates much of the Chicana Chicano community today. In a rush to appear more legitimate and satiate our thirst for sacred knowledge, We have embraced all manner of magical thinking while ignoring the fact that our ancestors were probably moving away from this. Indeed, we can preserve our rituals and ceremonies while also recognizing myth, symbolism, and metaphor for what they are. Things take a turn for the worse when Chicanas and Chicanos embrace new age concepts that are constantly being passed off as traditional Mesoamerican philosophies. A prime example of this is the unfortunate trend of the so-called Hunab Ku symbol, which is supposed to represent a Maya concept of balance. This symbol is not Maya, but rather a Mexica symbol that new age guru Jose Arguez distorted to resemble the Chinese yin yang. The very idea of Hunabku was invented by a Catholic priest who needed a term in Yucatec Maya to express the concept of the Christian God. So, sorry folks, but that cool-looking Maya tattoo you have is a New Age invention wrapped up in Christian propaganda. Ultimately, the reality is this. It is entirely possible to revere the interconnectedness of life, the planet we live on, and the beings living on it without being required to hold a worldview shaped by superstition and magical thinking. Unfortunately, the allure of sexing up our worldview with mystical mumbo jumbo in hopes of appearing deeply profound and spiritual has proven too intense for some to resist. I can think of no greater betrayal of my indigenous ancestors' philosophical and scientific advances than a blind embrace of superstition and magical thinking. So what's the solution? What can we do? Well, in my opinion, we need to open our minds and abandon the emotion-driven response to challenging our long-held traditional beliefs. I realize nobody likes being told that they were misled, especially when some of the traditional teachings they hold so dear were passed along by someone they respect. But the fact is, quite a few of the so-called traditional Mesoamerican teachings being bandied about today are relatively new inventions, many of which sprang from the New Age movement of the 1970s, the previously mentioned Hunabku symbol, for example, which you can learn more about on episode two of this podcast. We deserve to know what is fact and what is fiction. I firmly believe that as descendants of Mesoamerican people, we would be better served by embracing skeptical inquiry, critical thinking, and scientific literacy. This path will bring us knowledge. This approach will honor our ancestors. So, how do we discern reality from fiction? How do we recognize solid science, authentic ancestral knowledge, accurate history, actual medicine, and identify pseudoscience, invented knowledge, bogus pseudo-history, and New Age snake oil. Well, dear listener, I offer you a simple checklist that you can use to assist you in this ongoing process of discovery. I refer to this checklist as the four disagreements. Think of it as a vaccine against disinformation. Number one. Is the source of the claim reliable and supported by solid evidence? Knowing the source of a claim is incredibly important. For example, throughout this podcast, we have demonstrated that many of the alleged ancestral teachings promoted by those in Mexicayot and Danza communities 
originated with a group of pseudo-historians and nationalist extremists known as the Movimiento Cultural Restaurador de la Cultura de Anahuac, or the MCRCA, as well as many of its offshoot organizations and former members. Regardless of how good these claims may make us feel, we should be skeptical of any claim that can be traced back to these groups and individuals. As Carl Sagan has noted, arguments from authority carry little weight, as authorities have made mistakes in the past and will continue to do so in the future. This doesn't mean that we need to automatically reject or accept a claim based solely on its source, but rather certain sources of information do require enhanced levels of skeptical scrutiny. For example, cancer treatment advice coming from alternative medicine practitioners. Additionally, we must make sure that all claims are backed by solid evidence before accepting them to be true. And even then, we must be open to the possibility that new, more substantial evidence can arise to disprove them. The best available evidence, supported by independent confirmation from reliable sources, should guide our quest for knowledge. Disagreement 2. Is the claim being driven by personal beliefs and confirmation bias? All too often, we accept a claim as factual simply because it reinforces our worldview and aligns with firmly held beliefs. This approach is dangerous. When we purposely ignore all contradictory evidence and only rely on information that supports our ideas, we fall into the logical trap known as confirmation bias. Fortunately, the scientific method was developed to remove our biases and foregone conclusions by requiring us to seek ways to disprove our own hypothesis. Before coming to our conclusions, we need to consider and investigate all of the counter-arguments to our position, however uncomfortable they might make us feel. In science, we know this as making your hypothesis falsifiable. To quote Carl Sagan, try not to get overly attached to a hypothesis just because it's yours. It's only a way station in the pursuit of knowledge. Ask yourself why you like the idea. Compare it fairly with the alternatives and see if you can find reasons for rejecting it. If you don't, others will. Number three, does a claim fit into how the world works? One of the many pitfalls of magical thinking is that it requires us to ignore how the natural world functions and to view things through the lens of the supernatural. The literal belief that copal smoke is a living relative with its own will, for example. When a claim requires that we dismiss the very laws of nature in order to accept it, it's clear that we cannot trust the claim. For example, the claim that psychics can use extra-normal mental abilities to locate missing persons. Other examples of claims that are not supported by the laws of nature include energy healing, homeopathy, Reiki, acupuncture, communicating with spirits, mind reading, and earthing. And the final disagreement, can the claim be verified and tested, or does it rely on some hidden and unprovable knowledge. Claims that cannot be tested and falsified aren't worth much. It is a common tactic among New Age charlatans to claim that their knowledge has been passed down through generations from an ancient source, often a secret council or some unnamed elder. By not providing the sources needed to investigate their claims, these Teachers create a situation where one must trust their word alone as proof. They rely on the unquestioning loyalty of their followers to believe whatever they are told. This, of course, is unacceptable. Instead, we should look to Hitchens's razor, which states, What can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. This is a reference to the burden of proof. It is the responsibility, or the burden, of the individual making the positive claim to provide evidence, or the proof, regarding its 
truthfulness. If the person making the positive claim cannot provide evidence to back it, we can dismiss it without much argument. Individuals will often try to shift the burden of proof onto their detractors. Why don't you prove me wrong then, for example? Rather than backing up their statements with testable, falsifiable evidence. These individuals rely on their detractors' ignorance to muddy the waters and cast doubt on their opponent's position. It is a transparent giveaway that their claims cannot stand on their own merits. So there you have it. A simple four-step guide to distinguishing fact from fiction. I hope that you, dear listener, find it a useful addition to your intellectual toolkit. Well, that's quite a toolkit there, Curly. Yeah, I mean, and and it's funny because you you brought up a, a valid point about Leon Portilla, right? Um, when I first wrote this piece, I was reading well, what's the book that he wrote? The Aztec Philosophy, Aztec Thought and Culture, by mm-hmm. Leon Portilla. And like you mentioned, a lot of his interpretations have come unto. Uh, under scrutiny recently, especially his claims regarding Ometeot, which we actually cover in uh, episode two, I believe, of the first think, season. Yeah, yeah, one of those first episodes. So that goes back to one of these disagreements, right, about the sources, right? Is the source of the claim reliable and supported by solid evidence? So one of the, the things that I, a mistake that I see made, especially amongst, you know, those in the Danza community, is the tendency to just outright accept something because they like the source, you mm-hmm. know, regardless of the validity of the claim, or they outright reject something because of the source. Like rather than looking at the source and being like, well, here's where they're wrong. Here's where, because we're all human beings, right? Like not everything we say, not every claim we make is automatically deserving of just being dismissed outright or blindly accepted. Like each claim must be taken on its own merit. However, I think that some sources do require a certain level of enhanced scrutiny, I guess is what I'm saying. Like this person has a a history, for example, take somebody like uh, Paredes. And we know based on his past claims, we should probably. Well, you bring up Paredes here and. You know, people can make the argument that they have teachers whom they've learned from that don't necessarily belong to a secret council, which some of the older Mexicayo pioneers allude to. They most likely can point to someone within living memory, and in turn, those teachers can refer to those that came before them. So we have a couple of Mexica generations now. Um, But, you know, there are stories of these councils of elders out there. The MCRCA mentions them. Tlacaela used to talk about them. And some of my own teachers mm-hmm. have also mentioned them in the past. So our criticism of Paredes, you know, it has elicited some pushback by people who hold him up on a pedestal as if he could never do no wrong, you know, because he was of Maya descent and a native Maya speaker. So who are we to question his writings and teachings, right? I often get criticized that my Western education has somehow compromised my indigenous mm-hmm. worldview, but that's only because I'm critical of the tradición. If I were to follow the affirmatory pedagogy of other Mexica scholars out there, then I would be okay. You know, it's funny because Paredes also had a Western education and somehow, in his case, that enhances his stature. It's really convenient how this often plays out. You know, I mean, Paredes is a, one of the sort of pioneers and I guess you could you could say one of the founders of the tenets of Mexicayot. He was there mm-hmm. at the very beginning with uh, with este Rodolfo uh, Nieva Lopez, um, Nieva Lopez, and he was there. With, with, you know, when the MCRCA gets started, he knew some of these other uh, characters from the, from the early period, Juan Luna Cardenas, and so he he was he was very crucial to the foundation of oh, yeah, and 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 everything that emanates from it. Because I've met people right who are not necessarily within the Mexicayo tradition or who don't necessarily identify as Mexica, but they have adopted a lot of the Mexica ideology. And so the, you know, what, what would you say to someone? How, what is it about Paredes' teachings that 
can call into question not just the Hunabku um, uh, claims that he made about what that meant and where it comes from, uh, or if we also want to go back to the episode that we did on the um, the prophecy of the eagle and and the condor and and how you know the two halves of America were supposed to eventually meet. It was foretold. Blah blah blah. We've already covered that. Besides that, what else can we say about Paredes to not just you know, cast, um, you know, stones on, 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 you know, quote unquote, elders of the tradition. Mm -hmm. How, how dare we, right? So, so <laughs> what else can we say, right? We dare to say something. What are we saying? What else can we say about people like Paredes that if we use uh, these rules uh, on, on being skeptical and, and casting a skeptical eye to our own tradition, which is what we've tried to do. What else can we say about this? Well, I think um, the ideas about Paredes fall under a, a number of these, right? I think a lot of people are driven by personal beliefs and confirmation bias. So they automatically seek out things that already agree with what they believe. And they just accept those things at face value. And I think a lot of that comes from Paredes, where they don't want to investigate where did Paredes get his information from, mm -hmm. right? Because these things don't happen in a, in a vacuum, right? Um was he inventing these things whole cloth? Was he inspired by other teachers? And fortunately, thanks to you know our research skills and things like the internet, we're able to track back through time and find like the roots of a lot of where of you know his ideas came from, mm -hmm. and they come from sources which are highly questionable. For example, uh, Le Plongeon, uh, Theosophists. Uh, you know, spiritualists from Europe, you know, a lot of these allegedly traditional Maya worldviews were actually being introduced from Europe by conspiracists and occultists and theosophists and pseudo historians who were enamored with the Americas and were conjuring up all these ideas like well the the maya did they possibly come from atlantis you know so we can mm. with paredes we can trace directly to where he got his ideas from and they weren't from you know other maya like ancestral maya teachings they were introduced by by europeans and their ideas like for example just linguistically you know he he claims things like the Maya uh, word for uh, egg is where the Greeks got the word for soul. I mean, he, he makes like all these bizarre claims like the Maya traveled the world and taught the Greeks and the Romans and Egyptians philosophy and, and taught, which are things that are easily disprovable, right? Was he saying these things before Rodolfo Nieva Lopez was saying them and published in, in the Mexicayo book uh, in 1969, I think? That's a good question. I don't know if he was. The way that I understand it, and I could be wrong, is that Paredes was a member of the MCRCA. And while Nieva Lopez was making these claims, because he made similar claims, but he mm -hmm. was making them for the Mexica, right? For the Mexica, right. So you have competing claims one, Paredes is making them for the Maya because Paredes was basing it on the tradition of Le Plongeon and, and those guys who were uh, under the, under, they were operating under the, the framework of hyper diffusionism, right? Mm -hmm. That you have these ancient civilizations that are no longer existent, like Atlantis and like Mu and Lemuria and all this stuff, and that from those civilizations emanated all the other world civilizations. And so that's Paredes' frame of analysis comes from that, right? And then you have people like uh, Nieva Lopez, who is looking at this stuff and saying, well, actually, <laughs> it was the Aztecs. <laughs> and so the way my understanding of it is, and what I suspect as well, is that Paredes had his break off with the MCRCA because he felt that they should be focusing on the Maya. Of course, he's ethnically Maya and he's a native yeah. Maya speaker. So he he wanted to push the idea that 
you know, it was the Maya who did all of these things. Mm-hmm. And in fact, um, the newsletter that, uh, the newspaper that the MCRCA... Iscalot. Is, Iscalot. Yeah. Um, there's an issue of Iscalot where they talk about this debate that Paredes had with, with one of his students or his, um, like, mentee, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, about Jesus Christ dying on the cross mm-hmm. and how Jesus... Because the claim was, you know, that Jesus spoke Maya as he died on the cross. And what's funny is, is if you look at that issue of Iscalot, it's it states that they weren't debating whether... Jesus spoke Maya while dying on the cross. They were they debating even debating whether or not Jesus Christ ever even existed. Exactly. So they were starting off at a at a at the wrong spot. You know, <laughs> they were starting like if you look at a mathematical equation, you got to start off at the right spot otherwise you're going to get the the wrong answer, right? So they were starting off at halfway through the problem. And the debate was, well, what did Jesus say exactly in Maya? In Maya? <laughs> So, so we, from that, we know that Paredes was already starting to veer off, like pushing the idea that, well, it was the Maya. Like he was, he was centering the, the Maya, Maya as his. And, and Neva know, Lopez was centering them in the Mexica. Azteca. Yeah. And, and I think that that's what caused the split between the two. That's what eventually caused him. You know, that's something that had not occurred to me. I think you're probably onto something there. I mean, you know, it's, it's worth looking into future episode perhaps perhaps and i guess before we move on from paredes i should also mention that uh, some of the comments that were made after the uh, eagle and condor episode that we did for season one where we discuss uh, paredes and where he got that image from for his book un continente y una cultura and i think i mentioned that he had gotten it from a source that was uh, like an encyclopedic source that was published in the early 1900s mm-hmm. and someone had made the comment somewhere I forget where that but it's a codex uh, it's in this codex or what have you and I'm thinking sure that's where the original image comes from but even if you look at uh, una, un continente y una cultura where Paredes is describing the image and where he's talking about the eagle and the condor he does make the mention that some people have confused it, the the condor that he claimed, or the image that he claims to be a condor with, with a vulture, and that's exactly what's in, the, in that encyclopedia where that image is taken from. So mm-hmm. to say that Paredes was not drawing from sources that were outside of you know codices mm-hmm. is to not really understand his work and and what he was doing. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, I don't think people. Um a few, I know a few of those comments that you're referring to. Some people were, I don't know if they were deliberately misrepresenting what we had said or they just misunderstood what we had said. Because I think some people thought that we claimed that that image originated right. with this encyclopedia that was published by, I forget which, uh, was it the Smithsonian? I forget where... Um, it was held. Uh, yeah, I think it was a Smithsonian paper of some sort. But but the paper itself is called like an analysis of Maya oh, codices, Maya right? Codices. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like I didn't think we needed to to be that specific because I think you know there's an old saying that my mom used to tell me when I was a kid in Spanish: "Al buen entendedor pocas palabras." In other words, you know, do you need to overly explain everything that there is to be said about that topic? Right? Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some credit for something, right? <laughs> but you're you're right about Portilla, right? Like we shouldn't accept something just because he said it, but we shouldn't just outright reject something. Like like each claim needs to be investigated on its own merits. And I think that's a problem that people have a lot with questioning elders or teachers is we're expected to, well, this elder or teacher said this, ergo it must be factual. And when people like us say, well, let's look at that specific, you know, because they could be right. Sure. They, you know, they could also be wrong. Like, let's let's interrogate these claims individually so that we have a better informed opinion. That, my friend, is what is called the I believe it's called the argument from authority fallacy, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, yeah, the argument from authority, where while well, this person in this highly respected position said it, therefore, therefore I'm going to believe it. Yeah, it must be true. Yeah, and we see this a lot. Appeal to, oh no, that's, that's the wrong one. I was going to say appeal to irrelevant authority, but I guess you could also make that <laughs> yeah. case for that here as well. <laughs> But I digress. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, we we tend to fall into the traps of confirmation bias, you know, and we be just being people in general, right? Yeah, tend to follow fall into the traps of confirmation bias and appealing to authority because it's easier just to accept something because it makes us feel good and because somebody we respected says it, it's easier to do that than it is to be the asshole that's always like, well, hold on, let's take a look at that claim. And knowing that, you know, shit, something that I hold near and dear to myself might prove to be untrue. Like the declaration mm -hmm. of Cuauhtémoc, man, that that was a kick in the balls for me. I'm not going to mm -hmm. lie. Like I felt that. I, I really wanted that to be legitimate and his bones too yeah and Qualtemoc's bones which we'll be covering this season um <laughs> like to to find out that these things that I really wanted to be true to find out that they were not um it hurt I'm not gonna lie but that doesn't mean I'm just going to dismiss the evidence and hold on to those beliefs no matter what because they make me feel good because that's what religious fundamentalists do and I think that's the wrong approach to take it is, and but it's also um, unnecessary to continue to hold true certain beliefs, even after the evidence has proven them otherwise, um, without having to feel feelings of inauthenticity. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that plagues a lot of our indigenous communities, especially those that have um, uh, reemerged, you know, over the last several decades after you know a long hiatus and having gone underground. For example, I mean, I, I keep referring back to the Cuauhtémoc people here in, in Texas. A lot of those, um, you know, kept their identities underground for many, many, many generations, and it's only been within the last thirty, maybe forty years that you know, little by little, some of those communities have emerged to reassert themselves and in, in, in their place in 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 indigenous um, uh, society here in Texas and, and beyond, right? And so just because something that maybe you held true turns out not to be true that pertains to your identity doesn't mean that you're no less indigenous than you were the night before or the mm -hmm. day before. Yeah. You're still indigenous. You still belong to that community. It just means that you need to reassess some of the things that, that you thought were true about your beliefs and about your community. That's all we're saying. Yeah. I mean, when when it really boils down to the nitty gritty of what the purpose of the show has been and what it's going to continue to be is that we're not saying that any of these things that aren't necessarily true or that you need to probably, you know, uh, question a little more doesn't mean that it's going to make you less indigenous as some people out there might want you to feel. That's not even what we're saying. We're saying that, it, you know, in light of new evidence, it's probably a good idea to reassess some of those things that you hold true. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and it's only helpful, right? Because if you, if you look at, you know, the Florentine Codex, they make very clear arguments over like, this is what a good teacher is. This is what a good teacher does. This is what a bad teacher is. This is what a bad teacher does. And if you read this, which are the Huehuetlactoli, right? Like the ancient words of our ancestors, this mm -hmm. worldview that they had formed. They describe bad teachers as being the ones that will deceive you and will lie to you, right? So it's, it's kind of like hardwired into our culture to question things. And I think that when, by questioning things, you know, we're in that way, we are honoring our ancestors. I think it's dishonoring our ancestors just to accept stuff blindly because... You know, our, you don't create corn by accepting things blindly. You don't develop calendar systems by accepting things blindly. There was experimentation involved. There was 
disproving things that was involved. You know, they took what worked and they used that and they got rid of the things that didn't work and they built upon the knowledge of other people. They didn't accept anything blindly. If, if they had, then the calendar wouldn't work, right? If they just, well, we just feel this way. It, it should work this way. So we're just going to make it work that way. Well, that's not how the sun functions. So when we question things, I think we're actually doing the work of our ancestors. But then you might also have someone who comes um, and offers the perspective that perhaps this knowledge was imparted during some sort of ceremonial practice wherein some spirit spoke to the, the elders or the leaders or the people of knowledge on how to do a certain thing. And I mean, I have opinions about that, but I wanted to get your perspective on, on how would you respond to something like that? Because it falls under the broader category of magical thinking. Yeah, well, that also falls under um, what they call the uh, an appeal to tradition, right? So this is the way that they did it. So this is the way that we have to do it. And deviating from that is wrong. Or we were told that it has to be done this way. And what's funny is people have such a limited understanding. As an archaeologist, what I find is people have a hard time understanding deep time. Like even how much change can happen in a couple of hundred years, much less a couple of thousand years. Like Much less the last three years that we've been living under this pandemic. I mean, going on three years, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so we're doing things changed. now <laughs> that are way different than we were doing it three years ago. Right. But not necessarily. I mean, you still have those people out there, even, you know, within our communities who are distrustful of the government and who mm-hmm. distrust the science and who have not vaccinated and who have not who go out into the, you know, the public sphere without wearing masks and without practicing any kind of, you know, uh, safety protocols, visiting elderly people who are in their late 80s and 90s and exposing them to this virus because, they feel like they're protected by the spirits or whatever. Yeah, or ceremony will cure COVID. Like they could go to a sweat or go to a medicine meeting and have the, like COVID will be defeated by right. by ceremony. Magically, the ancestors came in through the the, the ceremonial fire and, and through the rocks and the steam and through our prayers, COVID was defeated. You know, it it, it kind of reminds me of that conversation we were having uh, a while ago before we started recording about um, people who believe in, in karma within our communities. I mean, you know, karma comes from a very specific culture and tradition, mm-hmm. uh, you know, across the world, and, and that's fine for them. And and if you're one of these people that believes in it, you know, it's your prerogative, more power to you. But one of the things I think I was mentioning to you, like, early on when I, I started really you know, questioning a lot of the stuff that that I was being um, inculcated, right, early on in the, in the tradition. And I would hear people talk about karma and how they believed in all this stuff. And and I would think, well, you know, I mean, if karma, maybe I don't understand what karma is, but if karma means action, work, or deed, and refers to the spiritual principle of cause and effect, were an intent and actions of an individual influence the future of that individual, And good intent and good deeds contribute to the good karma and happier rebirths, while bad intent and bad deeds contribute to bad karma and bad rebirths. And I was thinking, well, how shitty must of our ancestors have been, (laughs) right? (laughs) To To have everything happen to them that happened. Happen to them that has happened to them and us, right? For 500 plus years at this point. I mean, if you believe in karma, then you have to accept that our perhaps our ancestors weren't all that great. <laughs> well, and the other thing, something that closely aligns with that I hear a lot about is, um, I don't know if you remember when that uh, that really stupid book and, you know, movie, The Secret, came oh, right. out. Yeah, yeah. And it was all about intent and putting your intent out. And if you put, whatever you put out is going to come back to you. And I'm like, well, hold on a minute. So... All these people that have horrible things happen to them, like it's their own fault. It's like their that's own a, fault. It's a really weird, disturbing way to look at the world. It is right. It's it's almost like the white supremacist worldview of the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, where 
they uh, practiced this this notion of social Darwinism, and and the idea was that if you were poor, it was your own fault. So yeah, through this yeah, worldview, what you Charles Darwin's survival of the fittest idea was misused to promote the notion that the strong see their wealth and power increase, while the weak see those things decrease over time. And if you were poor, you were born that way, and you would continue to exist in a sort of cycle of poverty and perpetuity. And luckily for the rich, you know, they get to make the rules and will use them to... Yeah, our entitlement was earned. Exactly. <laughs> it was It was more than earned. We inherited it through genetics. Yeah. I mean, that was yeah. that was the whole point of social Darwinism, that you were genetically superior. To, and it just so happened to be that the Nor- um, Nordic European, Western Nordic Europeans were at the top of that of that list and everybody else just kind of fell in line down the, the, the ladder of... Mm-hmm. Of uh, of social Darwinism, and it's it's almost the same thing. I mean, yeah, if you, well, if you really yeah, compare it, is. it, right? It's saying that wh- whatever comes back to you, you you sort of deserved it. You caused it because of mm-hmm. your what you put out to the universe yeah. in this magical way. It it just came back to you, and so then what it does is, it's like well, it kind of removes any sort of blame right for all the horrible things that happens to people because it was your own fault that it happened to you it's like you know blaming the victim to the next level (laughs) right blaming the victim on steroids well one of the things that i want to do this season um is i've been racking my brain trying to come up with a term or a phrase because we've used like the tradition and mexicayot and stuff as as especially mexicayot we've used that as sort of like the framework of a lot of our criticisms but i don't know if it's in if that term alone encompasses everything that that's uh you know like the anti-vax stuff or the weird conspiracy thinking stuff because people in the mexicayot certainly um gravitate to those things like they incorporate yeah. those things into mexicayot yeah they but do i'm trying to come up with like a bigger term like a broader term so that's going to be my objective this season is i'm just going to start trying to come up with a term that okay. better better describes, describes because one of a term that i heard and it doesn't it's it's a good term but it's not all encompassing enough is this um conspirituality conspirituality I really like that term because it it does describe a lot of what we're talking about. But it blends it blends conspiracy and spirituality, like religious thinking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But there's well, also I mean, more to it because we're all then we'd be leaving out the pseudo history. So I don't know if yeah. there's like a a big a big tent idea or a broad umbrella term that I could come up with or we could come up with to. Okay. To more specifically describe well, I, the things that we're talking about. I did come up with one, but it's kind of Mexica-centric, so I don't know if we want to go with that one. What's, Should what's I that? say it now? What? The Mexicanans? Yeah. Mexicanans? <laughs> <laughs> well, did I tell you about that video I saw of the Cholo talking about uh, adrenochrome and, and the Mexicas? Wait, a Cholo talking about adrenochrome? <laughs> yeah. So that's not, that's not a real thing, is it? <laughs> Um, those two things just don't <laughs> jive, like cholo and adrenochrome. <laughs> but that... apparently they do. So I saw this video where this cholo is like sitting in a park, and he's talking about human sacrifice. Was he singing? Sitting in the park, <laughs> waiting for you. Don't ever, don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> but he's sitting in this park, and he's talking about human sacrifice amongst the Mexica. And I'm just listening to him. I'm watching this video. Somebody shared it with me. And they were just like, what do you think of this? And they sent it to me. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, they were sacrificing children in order to collect their adrenochrome. And I was like, holy shit. This is like next level craziness right here. Are you serious? So I started referring to that as Cuvonan. (laughs) Cuvonan. Which is like the Cholo (laughs) version. We have Mexicanans, Cubanans. So anyway, that's that's one thing I want to try to do. Because what I'm noticing, uh, especially in the Danza community, because that's who I associate a lot with, is this propensity to um, for like alternative medicine and magical thinking. And like you said, not wanting to get vaccinated because the spirits will protect them or the ceremony mm-hmm. will protect them. And then, you know, I see a lot of 
people in the Danza community, the Mexicago community, sharing things through social media. And this caught my eye, so I saved it specifically for this episode. And it was this meme that I've seen Danzantes sharing, right? And it's just, it's a quote. And it says, <clears throat> Everything changes when you start to emit your own frequency rather than absorbing the frequencies around you. When you start imprinting your intent on the universe rather than receiving an imprint from existence. And then, what? Yeah. And then it it's, comes from this woman named Barbara Marciniak. So, of course, I'm like, well, who's Barbara Marciniak? And why are Dansantes? Sounds like one of those deputies from, what's his name? Um, Deepak Chopra. Well, <laughs> it's funny you mention that because on the bottom it says at Chopra. So I think, <laughs> I think Deepak Chopra originally retweeted this and then put his, his uh, at on the bottom. But... I was like, well, who's this woman and why are Nansantas sharing? So I, I look her up, Barbara Mar Marciniak. And this is from her own website, okay? So I'm not even like telling you what other people have said about her. But but just to be clear, these are Nansantas who I presume see themselves as part of an ancient tradition, mm -hmm. inheritors of an ancient tradition. And, yeah. and who is this yeah. woman in relation to that? She's just like, well, I'll tell you who she is in relation to it. I'm, I'm I mean, trying, she, I'm she's trying, not in... I'm trying, she's, to frame, I'm, I'm trying to prep the audience for the framing here, because I don't even know. I'm about to hear this for the first time myself, So, but I kind of have an inkling as to where you're going with Well, this. she's not a, a associated with dansa or, or uh -huh. indigenous ways at all. But what she is, and this is from her own website, Barbara Marciniak is an internationally acclaimed trance channel inspirational speaker and best-selling author. And then it lists the books that I'm not going to name the books because I don't want yeah, people buying don't. them, yeah. um, which collectively have been translated into more than 20 languages, yada, yada, yada. She has a BA in social science and is the publisher and editor of the quarterly newsletter, The Pleiadian Times. And then now remember, it says she's a trance channel, right? And then it goes on to state that her extensive worldwide travels, astrological studies, and a lifetime of alternative free thinking augment her personal understanding of the material that she channels. So what does she channel? The Pleiadians are a collective of multidimensional spirit beings yeah, from the Pleiades star system and have been speaking through Barbara since May of 1988. <laughs> and Don Santos are listening to this garbage. And this is what Don, Don Santos are sharing, the wisdom of this woman who channels the Pleiadians, but only since 1988. I don't know what the Pleiadians were up to prior to 1988. Wait, um, are these the same as the Raelians? The no, Canadians? no, the, the, that's a different group. Oh, that's a different one. But it's all overlapping, right? Yeah. So this is sort of what we're getting to with this, you know, with this episode. If you use the four disagreements, if you looked at this person and and you just ran them through, you know, does this claim fit into how the world works? Well, no, it doesn't because nobody channels aliens, right? <laughs> um. Can this claim be verified and tested? Well, how do you prove whether somebody's channeling? Right. You know, so it's not falsifiable. Um, is this claim being driven by personal beliefs and confirmation bias? So obviously this the people sharing sad. this are sharing it because it resonates with them. Um, I don't know if they've bothered to study exactly what this woman's claims are. Probably beyond. not. And is the source of the claim reliable and supported by solid evidence? Well... So I think this is a good example of the four disagreements in action is how they can be used to analyze uh, this woman and the claims that she's making. And just, you know, this whole idea of imprinting your intent on the universe and everything changes that goes to that speaks to what you were just talking about. Right. Like, yeah. you're putting stuff out and it's coming back to you. Mm -hmm. And that's not rooted in any sort of reality. It's it's nonsense. But this is the it's kind nonsense. of stuff that 
unfortunately, people are drawn to. And I would challenge these danzantes to find a source from either the danza tradition or from, you know, going back to the pre-invasion period, if there is such a source that, we, that can be consulted, even the Florentine Codex, if something like this was a belief among the Mexica, it must have been annotated in, in, in that codex at least, right? You would think. Yeah, and I've, I've, I, I make it a point to read the entirety of the Florentine Codex every have year. You, have you come across a reference that, that sounds even remotely similar to what, what this is being portrayed as? No. <laughs> Don Santos, in, in short, please, Don Santos, I urge you, please, get get a grip, get a grip on reality, seriously. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's going to happen, man, because you know what I like to say. What's that, Nuchan Tlacat? The truth is like medicine; it doesn't always taste good, but it's always good for you, and they can make you disagree. <laughs> yeah, four times even. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Tales from Astlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, Timo Itase. <laughs>